everybody. On behalf of Beth Tikva Synagogue and our Adult Education and Israel Affairs Committees, I would like to welcome everyone to our very special program this evening. My name is Gail Kurtzman. I uh, do program and events at Beth Tikva. And I'm also the granddaughter of four Holocaust survivors. And it is my privilege to be part of this conversation between our senior rabbi, Jared Grover, and Alicia Wiesel, the son of Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel. I am so happy that so many of you have joined us tonight. I know this will be a meaningful discussion for us all, especially in a time where anti-Semitism and hatred is on the rise here in Canada and the rest of the world. A special thank you to Marilyn St. Clair and Liberation 75 for partnering with Beth Tikva and supporting the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. Unfortunately, Marilyn couldn't be with us tonight, but she wanted me to share with you a very important Liberation 75 initiative. If you are a Holocaust survivor or you know of someone, Liberation 75 is seeking Canadian survivors who have not yet given their testimony to the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation. They will go across Canada for free and film in any language. Please go to the Liberation 75 website for more information. Just a reminder, this program is being recorded. And at the end, if we have time, we will take a question or two. So please feel free to send me any questions or comments. I'd now like to hand it over to Beth Tikva's senior rabbi, Jared Grover. Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see so many people on the call. I want to thank you, Gail, for all your help in organizing the event. Daniel, who's doing the tech work. Uh, our Adult Ed Committee at Beth Tikva and our Israel Affairs Committee and everyone at Liberation 75 for help in, the help in putting together this event and the wonderful work that you do uh, throughout the year. Uh, on the other side of the screen, you're uh, seeing somebody who's probably carrying around the weightiest legacy of any Jew in the world. Alicia Wiesel uh, uh, is an incredible, incredible person in his own right, not just somebody who who has the responsibility to carry forward his father's legacy. And I want to share with all of you a bit uh, about his life from his resume. He calls himself a recovering Wall Street executive. Since retiring from a 25-year uh, financial markets career at Goldman Sachs at the end of 2019, he served in 2020 as one of the lead technologists in Mike Bloomberg's presidential campaign. When his father passed in 2016, Alicia realized how many others missed his voice. And so when opportunities for impact arise, Alicia shares his father's message and continues his legacy by standing up for persecuted communities. In the last few years, Alicia has spoken at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum about the need to protect the LGBTQ community. He's shown a light while speaking at Auschwitz on the plight of Syrian refugees being denied Western asylum. He's written for the Financial Times about the urgency of upholding DACA, and he's taken his son to peacefully march for Black lives. During a speech last Thursday at the UN on Holocaust Remembrance Day, he used his platform to address the persecution of Muslims. During his time in quarantine during the pandemic, Alicia says that he's been using his time to learn Metallica songs on guitar from his son, learn TikTok dances from his daughter, organized his father's archives, learned a little Talmud every day, and tried to be a good father, husband, and son. Well, in the midst of all that busyness, we're very grateful, Alicia, <laughs> that you made the time uh, to spend with us here in Toronto and uh, to give us a chance to get your thoughts on some of the human rights and, and other challenges that we, uh, that we see around us in the world today. I just want to say a word before I, before I let you say hello uh, about the format. Uh, you all know that I wish we could have time for questions from everybody in the audience, um, but we have an hour. And I already apologize to Alicia saying, um, I'd love to schmooze a little bit, but there's so much going on in the world now and so little time. We've got to jump right in to some questions. But if we have time, I told Gail, she can choose one question, one question from the chat room. 
So if you have the chat box and you're joining us using the Zoom platform, come up with a really good question and you might win the question of the evening for Alicia and Gail will ask it if we have time at the end of the program. Alicia, welcome. Great to see you, Rev Grover, and uh, not to immediately start negotiating, but wouldn't it be more Jewish to take four questions? <laughs> Give us the time and we'll take four, but I'm sure we'll work it. I out. don't want, I, I want to be uh, respectful of your schedule. I, I was, I was saying to you earlier, Alicia, you know, I didn't know really what we were going to talk about a few months ago when we booked this, um, when we booked uh, tonight's Zoom meeting. And now I've got a list so long, there's no way we're going to get to everything. Okay. Let's talk, let's jump right into the most, the, the story that's been in the headlines most recently. Your name that's actually literally been in the headlines most recently. Everybody saw, I hope everybody saw this incredible advertisement that you uh, put in the New York Times, a full page talking about uh, the Olympic Games that are beginning in a few days in China, drawing attention to the plight of the Uyghurs and their terrible, terrible treatment by the People's Republic of China. I want to ask you a tough question about this, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I, I'm, I have a lot, and I, I, I want to be a little bit tough with you. I've been following the campaign from the human rights people over the past few years to draw attention to the plight of, of the Uyghurs and stop the Olympics and, and gain some recognition. And here we are a few days away from the Olympics. And other than your article, I don't see much. Has this campaign been a failure? Depends how you measure it. I think that one of the things my father very much believed, individuals of conscience speak up. They're doing it as much Obviously, they want to change the world, but the one thing that they are really trying to prevent is the world from changing them. And China is an incredibly powerful country. And by the way, it's a country that deserves our respect in so many ways. Uh, it's really pulled itself out of poverty at a massive scale, um, has become an incredible competitor on the world stage. And I would just say that Chinese values, as I see them you know, play out with Chinese-American families that I know and love, are values that I think resonate with our own values, an incredible respect for ancestors and family, uh, the values of education above all else. So I actually think that in many ways with the Chinese people, forget the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party for a moment, I think we actually have a lot in common with the Chinese people. And um, even if we're not going to move them much because China is so powerful and these Olympics are going to proceed, if we are able to get a few conversations started, and one thing I want to point out is a big difference between today and the 1936 Olympics that occurred in Nazi Germany is you have a politically active workforce in a way that I think the world has never seen before. You have a workforce that in the wake of George Floyd in the US, was there a single American corporation that wasn't forced to grapple with what diversity and inclusion statements they were gonna put forward and what was their view on police brutality. Some of them contorting themselves into pretzel knots, you know, and in, in saying things that no longer made sense, but the pressure was unbelievable for them to do it. I don't think we're gonna tap into that for the Uyghurs. It's so far away. Everybody does business with China. It's not something you're gonna hear about every day. But if we get a number of employees at each company to start a conversation you never know where these things go. So you, you, what do you think the Jewish community should be saying about the upcoming Olympic Games? Should we be boycotting them? Should we not be watching them? Should we be outraged that they're taking place? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, you know, I think that for the Jewish community to watch what's unfolding, and of course, the big problem here is that China has such a tight control over information. They control the press so tightly that there's not a ton to report on. We get reports from those who have escaped the system, from those who still have relatives. But remember, so many Uyghur dissidents here, there would be many more, except their families are still over there with incredibly bad repercussions for them if they are to speak up. So it reminds me a lot of the Soviet Union and what my father and Natan Sharansky mm -hmm. and so many greats of you know the generation that came before us did um, when they when they stood up to them. Tell me what the response has been like to that advertisement. 
It was just last Saturday, right? It was just last yep. Saturday, this, a couple of days ago. Well, first of all, I'll tell you that I've never, um, you know, I was a, uh, a chief information officer at Goldman. And so one of the things I need to do is cybersecurity. Boy, did I do a cybersecurity scrub on my own house. Like, <laughs> oh boy, you know, like, get ready. The Chinese might be coming. Yep, I'm sure, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there might be a few taps in your phone. <laughs> Look, I've, I've you know, that. I'm not a huge social media guy, but I will tell you, you know, on Twitter, this post, you know, post started going, I don't, I don't post on social media. I try not to use it on Shabbat, but others did who were involved. And I'm still to this day seeing three more people liking it, following it, retweeting it. It's mm. still got this bubble. This news cycle is not over because the Olympics are about to begin on Friday. And, and there's one more point that I want to make about what's realistic to expect. Feng Shui, you know, Feng Shui, this um, tennis star in China, is basically disappeared because she brings forth a sexual assault charge um, against a, a member of the you know the Politburo, someone who's senior in the CCP. And something kind of amazing happened. The Women's Tennis Association in the United States decided that they were going to take profitably, you know, likely what is one of the most profitable gigs, and they're going to cancel it. They're going to cancel it because they believe she's being mistreated. They don't believe the evidence that they've seen that she's okay, they think it all looks forced and staged, and they actually forewent money, right? Like that's like the, the, the line to be crossed is amazing. They mm -hmm. forewent money in order to take a stand and say they don't wanna be part of it. Now, the IOC is operating at a such bigger scale than the Women's Tennis Association, but if you're in the Women's Tennis Association, it looks pretty big for you if this is your biggest contract. So it does show that in the world of sports, no matter how important that Chinese sponsorship is, no matter how important everything that they're doing to stage it is, it is possible for people of conscience to take an important stand. So we're going to be watching uh, an Olympic, well, I, some of us are going to be watching these Olympic Games. Your view is we should be boycotting them. But for those who are watching, we're going to see a bunch of countries walking through the stadium and thinking about human rights in the world today and which countries are on the right path and which countries are on the wrong path. This is your bread and butter. Tell us, Alicia, are human rights in the world today heading in the right direction? Or when you see those countries marching forward, is your head gonna be shaking saying, the world is, uh, is going down into a dangerous place? Well, first of all, look, directionally, if you compare it to where we were 100 or 200 years ago, the march towards democracy and human rights is relentless. The world has improved greatly. The quality of life for the planet is much higher um, for, for you know, pretty much like no matter where you are, the quality of life is going to be better than it was uh, 200 years ago. And a lot of that is the but spread I'm not of talking about the. I'm not talking about the quality of life. That's a different mm -hmm. question. I'm asking about human rights. I still think that human like rights freedom are- Freedom of are... expression. Think of Russia, think of China, think of, I'll list a whole bunch of them. Think of so many countries in the Muslim world where you cannot speak out against rulers. Yeah, look, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Is there a lot of change that needs to happen? Absolutely. Do I think that, you know, the, uh, you know, what's the great quote about the, um, the arc of justice is long, but you know, it, it, it get it bends to, it bends there eventually. I'm, I'm, I'm mangling the quote, yeah. but like, I think we're headed in the right path. Um, and it, it's, it's funny because the question I've been thinking a lot, which I think is part of that is how do you budge these countries that don't share the same liberal human rights views that we do, that don't share Western liberal values, so to speak. And if you look at ultimately how we beat the Soviet Union, I would argue that a large part of it, um, first of all, obviously Reagan outspent them. You can get very pragmatic in dollars and cents about it. But ultimately there was, there was a problem within the system. It took a long time to build, but when it did, it fell fast. And I think that what we needed to do in the Western world was live up to our ideals and our values as best as we can, because the better we do at continuing to show the world that with all of the pain and suffering that comes with a free press, with all of the pain and suffering that comes from different, often polarly, you know, polar opposite views 
being expressed and hurled each other and dissent and all the all the things that make people scream democracy is not working when actually it's working just fine it just happens that there's a divergence of views if we can over time show that in the long run this is still the stable and best and most perfect form of government that has ever been devised um, that i think is the path that ultimately we just have to be the best people we can be within the frameworks we operate in. You gave me a good segue, Alicia. You know, you're talking a bunch of Canadians. We're looking at what's going on in the United States. And I, for one, am not so confident that everything's going so well uh, with, with uh, the Democ what, what we might be called, what, might, what you're calling liberal democracy in the United mm -hmm. States. I think a lot of people uh, in, in more authoritarian countries say, is that what you want in the U.S.? A bunch of a mob going, coming into the Capitol building and threatening to kill everybody inside? That's what democracy is. Mm -hmm. We want peace and we want order. And sometimes that means giving up your rights. So you're coming to us from New York, right? Tell us about your thoughts on the United States, on U.S. politics, on how human rights plays into the discussions that you're hearing among your friends about um about where the country might be headed uh, in the next few years. So look, I'm much more of an optimist on these things, and I try to yes, take a bit of a- Yes, you are, I can, that's why I'm yeah. challenging you. And, and I, take, <laughs> I take a bit of a, longer, of a longer view on it. Look, I had friends who, you know, if I ever said anything positive about President Trump, they wouldn't talk to me for months. Um, I also had friends who couldn't shut up about, you know, how dare you not be with the president on every single issue. We're a deeply divided country right now. Um, I don't think that that started with President Trump's um, administration. I think that that was well underway even during the Obama administration and before. And that's because there are big forces at play. Um, you know, America is consumed with this question of race. It's consumed with this question of how socialist should we be versus how capitalist, where should that line be drawn, and how does it interact with some of the big issues of the day, whether that's voting rights, whether that's the environment. Um, and I, I don't happen to believe that, you know, we are fighting about these things in any way that is fundamentally different from the passions that have swept the political process or have swept the population in the past. I think it feels very intense because we're all living it right now and the stakes are always high. But at the end of the day, you know, I happen to be, um, it's funny, I take some of this from my father and I know you wanna talk only about current events, but I'm gonna inject a little bit about my relationship please, with my please. father and what I took yes, from him, right? Please. That's kind of why I'm here in yes. part. Um, my father was a loyal patriot to the United States of America not much got to him, but when we would fly back from abroad and we'd come through JFK airport and a customs official would stamp his passport and say, welcome home, his eyes would get wet. The thought that somebody was telling him, welcome home, he had such a deep appreciation for the United States as being the country that became his adopted homeland, the, the, the country that gave him a shore to come to because he had been a journalist on assignment um, I think for Yidiot Achronot, covering whether it was the UN or before, he was he was covering in the United, in, in New York City, and he'd been hit by a cab, and he had to go. He missed because he was hit by a cab. He was in a hospital in a body cast for maybe two months, and he missed his appointment to get the visa renewed. And he was terrified. You can imagine my father's experience. He's terrified of government officials, anybody who controls a passport. And he tells me the story that he went to the, the customs office and the customs officer said, you know, you could just reapply for your visa, but you can also become a citizen. Do you know that? Hmm. Wow. Imagine that, you know, in, in this environment where there's so much stress on immigration, such terrible things being said, um, such terrible accusations um, and, and blowing things out of proportion. That simple story reminds me that, you know, I believe that the United States, like Canada, which opened its doors to, to so many uh, in the wake of the Shoah. I think that these Western liberal democracies, they are, they, they represent something real and something beautiful. And I happen to believe in the experiment so much that I'm, I'm kind of all in. Um, so, you know, I if, hope if, you're if, right. If there's any, I put it this way, if there's anything that I can do to make it better, I feel committed to do it. I hope you're right. I think all of us in Canada are rooting for an America that finds its better angels at, at this moment in history. So let me talk about a few domestic uh, headlines in the United States. 
this has sort of been a couple of weeks of apology tours when it comes to uh, comments that are being made about anti-Semitism. I uh, mean, like Whoopi so, Goldberg? She's one of them. And then a few weeks earlier, even even the president had to retract some of his comments after the Colleyville hostage taking. There was the FBI director and a number of media outlets. And as I said, the president himself, who could who could not in the uh, initial hours following the situation, identify this as an anti-Semitic incident, despite the fact that it happened in a synagogue on Shabbos morning by an Islamic anti-Semite for the sake of another Islamic anti-Semite. So tell me, as you look at the apology tour going on, these are smart people, Whoopi Goldberg, president of the United States, director of the FBI, and they don't understand what anti-Semitism is. Where have we gone wrong? What are we doing wrong? Where are we <laughs> failing to explain to people uh, the nature of anti-Semitism, because if we can't, uh, if, if people can't identify it, what hope do we have of, of, of ever challenging it? It really reminded me of when President Obama said, you know, a bunch of people got killed at the uh, Hypermarché, you know, in uh, mm. the French kosher supermarket. Yes, yes. A bunch of people. Right. Um, look, we're a people, Jewish people. That's confusing. I mean, are we a religion? Are we a race? We're kind of both, right? Our doors are open. Anybody who comes in as a ger is embraced and they're, uh, they're Ben or Bat Avraham Vasara. Immediately they have a lineage. You know, they're, they're part of our people. Um, yet we also have a connection to the land of Israel that goes back for thousands of years. And we have a genetic connection to all of our ancestors who came, who went through all these incredible places in the diaspora and enriched their cultures and were enriched by them along the way. We're a very, the world almost doesn't know what to do with a people that has been around for as long as we have, because it almost doesn't compute. You know, you listen to, um, one of the big haters that occasionally gets quoted to me, you have all these these Jewish groups that are, are self-hating. You have, you know, Code Pink. And the woman there was saying, oh, I know where my family is from. It's not Israel. You know, I can prove that my family is from Spain. Yeah, well, guess where you were from before you were from Spain, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago. I can tell you, you know, you came from from the diaspora out of out of Israel. So I think that fundamentally that's a confusing thing. We have to be a bit more... Um, we have to do what we're doing, which I, is, I think, be a little bit more angry. And, you know, I don't love anger, but I think it has its place. And if you look at the anger, forget, sometimes there's what people say, and then there's how you say it. At the end of the day, the anger that came out of the African-American community in the wake of George Floyd, something just ticked them off. This was just you know, whether it was right or wrong to conclude that police brutality was a widespread phenomenon that deserved contemplating measures like shutting down police departments, whether or not you believe that, the emotional reaction was severe and it was immediate and you were left with no questions as to what this community thought and, and how it was feeling. And, you know, we as a Jewish community, first of all, we're a little bit more divided. We have so many different opinions, and then we like to talk about it, and we rationalize it. And sometimes there's really nothing to do but just get angry. And, you know, when I encounter people in my life who occasionally are just, you know, ignorant past the point where it becomes clear that they're really not listening, or they're not wanting to listen, or they're not wanting to hear what it feels like to be a Jew in 2022, you know, I can get a little angry, not offensive, not rude, but maybe a little angry and let it's my emotions part of the go. reason why you're angry. It's part of the reason why you're angry, because in America today, Jews are seen as white and therefore cannot also be victims. I'm angry because Jews are still getting hurt. I'm angry because we're being attacked from left and right. And everybody just wants to say, no, 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 it's somebody else's problem. 
On the right, they want to finger point at the left and say, yeah, 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 the anti-Semitism just comes from Ilhan Omar, you know, uh, making it clear that like it's open season on people who, you know, think Israel is a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. Or and then on the left, people point at the right and they say, no, 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 it's the other way around. All the danger is from Charlottesville, when really what both of those groups need to do is take a look at their own backyard rather than scoring political points on the other. And that's why I'm angry, because, you know, we're not. We're not seeing an effective response. We're just seeing a lot of convenient finger pointing across the political aisle. So your solution is if the community, the broader community could get angrier over anti-Semitism, no matter where it comes from, instead of picking its favorite bullies, um, we might have a more effective response. I think if people is that see your contention. I think if people see a genuine emotional response for it, like this battle is not going to be won by the like thousand page dissertation explaining our historical connection to the land of Israel or explaining the history of anti-Semitism. Like, you know, God bless Deborah Lipstadt. I'm very glad that she's getting that job, God willing. You know, we need a someone who really understands and can explain this stuff. But I think that this is going to be won in the court of public opinion based on our emotional reactions, when our non-Jewish brothers and sisters see that we are pissed off because we've had enough, and these little myths and crazinesses that you can't uh, suffer a racist attack because you're white, we have to have a response to that, and it should be mm -hmm. genuine and emotional, and it shouldn't be abusive. It shouldn't burn a bridge, but sometimes a, a, a well, you know, a, a true expression of emotion, I think, can do the trick. So I don't want to pick too much on the United States. I don't know Both if you it. heard, but we have our problems in Canada too. Mm -hmm. Over the weekend, um, we had a truckers rally. I don't know if you heard about it. Yeah, I saw, I saw pictures. Yep. Where a bunch of people gathered, truckers, but also many supporters outside uh, parliament to protest some of the restrictions that, that the countries had to impose, including vaccinations. At that rally, I don't know if you saw this, but there were many demonstrations of anti-Semitism, racism, white nationalism. People saw swastikas. And the truth is, throughout the pandemic, I've seen people borrow Holocaust terminology in order to um, in, in, in order to inflame. Uh, the conversation yeah. the yellow saying, star oh, unvaccinated exactly right? Yeah. right i want to know if you think the pandemic the role of the pandemic and this borrowing of holocaust terminology does it cheapen for you the memory of the Shoah? what is your reaction when you hear about the resurgence of nazi and white nationalist manifesta um in in the wake of the pandemic Look, ignorance is ignorance. Um, it makes me feel more committed than ever that Holocaust education programs should be funded and should be cultivated and should succeed wherever they are. For me, obviously, it doesn't cheapen the Shoah. My, my sense of the Shoah is in no way cheapened by what they've done. Um, but it is wrong. I don't necessarily think it should be illegal, but it's wrong and it should be pushed back on. When you... When you when you see people um, wearing yellow stars, you're saying that doesn't just because they feel that they're being discriminated against, but because they're not vaccinated, to you, that doesn't cheapen the memory of the Shoah. It doesn't cheapen it for me, but it's an offensive thing to do. OK, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think I think that we're trying to understand this um, in, in Canada right now, what our response should be. Uh, when we see some of these symbols. And I think for a lot of Holocaust survivors, they look at th these symbols are so um, uh, pow powerfully controversial and so blatantly offensive that they bring back terrible memories for people. And it's hard not to be on the side of those whose suffering is now being re-invoked by, by um, situations that cannot be compared. I, I, I leave that with you. I'm not going to challenge you, but uh, uh, look, the, there's the, more the, to discuss there. There's a look there's we could get into a whole conversation on what's the strategy to keep memory alive, whether it's memory of the Shoah, whether it's, 
you know, the memory of what happened in World War II, whether it's Jewish memory. And I think that there are many planks, but, you know, I, I have a slightly different approach on this. I think it's important to call out things like that that are offensive and to do so with anger where appropriate. Um, but, you know, my focus is actually a little bit different when it comes to memory as a strategy, but you have somewhere you want to take us. No, no, no. Tell me, what, tell me about that. Your strategy is, is different. How so? Look, it doesn't necessarily translate on a global scale, but, you know, my priorities when it comes to memory are, you know, I spend time talking to my children about the Shoah. I've taken, you know, my son when he was bar mitzvah, I took him to Seagat where my father grew up and then to Auschwitz. But Shoah memory is probably, you know, two to five percent of my kid's Jewish education. And that's quite intentional. Not because I want to minimize it, not because I don't want them to understand the principles and how important it is to defend, you know, when we see it being misunderstood. But for them, you know, I'm thinking forward 10, 20 years, whenever they're going to make a decision on to intermarry or not, raise the kids Jewish or not, send them, you know, to, to shul on Shabbos or not. So what I try to surround them with is joy. I want their experience of Judaism to be joyful. So where I put my energy in is I'm going to make sure that not only do they know the full benching every Friday night, but that we sing the full benching. Mm -hmm. That if we, if my father raised me singing Shalom Aleichem, they're going to learn Eishas Chayil. And that the memory from start to finish of what a Shabbos dinner looks like in my home, my kids are going to have seared into their brain in the same way that I believe anger is an effective tool that we haven't used in our political fights on the stage there. I believe that emotion is the most powerful tool that we can use in shaping our children in continuity and memory. And there, I think the dominant emotion needs to be joy. Um, so when we get to like strategy- well, I, I agree with you. I'm just, I love hearing this from you. It's one thing for me to say it. It's something else for Alicia Wiesel to say, let's not dwell too much on the pain of the past. And remember that we have to build a positive, hopeful Jewish identity for the future. Uh, it's music to my ears. Speaking, I of, think that that's that that's the cornerstone of my whole like strategy on memory that that crosses generations. Beautiful. So speaking of hope, I want to move to the state of Israel and ask you a few questions about uh, how we should be relating to to this uh, criticism against Israel and also to the human rights challenges uh, that take place between Israelis and Palestinians. So this week, uh, Amnesty International uh, said that many of Isra Israel's policies impose a, a cruise, uh, imposed a, a cruel system of apartheid against the Palestinian people. I want to ask you this. What do you tell progressive-minded people when they express concern over Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, whether they use the term apartheid, apartheid or not, when they say, I find it very hard to be proud of Israel today when there's clear uh, mistreatment against, uh, against, against a vulnerable minority. How do well, you answer that? Well, let's start, let's start with Amnesty International. And by the way, you know, uh, obviously, you're a friend, but like if it came in and it was like a hostile question, I might respond with a little bit of anger if it was appropriate. Um, but, you know, Amnesty International, if you read the text, the crime of apartheid starts in 1948. Mm -hmm. So the mere existence of the state of Israel is an intolerable act for Amnesty International. Amnesty International wishes that there had been no state of Israel. Amnesty International wishes that, you know, the, the doors would have been closed. Maybe the British mandate would have survived for longer. All of these Jews who were fleeing the DP camps would have had nowhere to go, no ability to restart their lives. And we would continue living the way we had in the Middle East for centuries as Dimi, as a second class population um, exposed to things like the Far Hood, where, you know, hundreds of Jews were killed uh, in Iraq and in other places throughout the Arab Middle East. So this, this whole concept that apartheid starts in 1948 is such a biased, terrible starting point that really anything else they say, you just, it's hard to take seriously. But look, the larger issue is for those who, who use these words horribly, and by the way, I am much more incensed, you know, I, I'm terribly incensed when I hear people use the word apartheid because my father traveled to South Africa in 1975 with me 
Um, and I, I have this incredible document that I found in the archives of, of a letter that um, the, the hosting organization in South Africa wrote from the Jewish community because I had a nanny traveling with me. I was three years old and she was Jamaican. And it made very clear, if this young woman feels in any way mistreated because of the color of her skin, the Wiesel family is turning around. Mm. So, you know, we got to see apartheid up close and personal. And um, it's crazy. We have, you know, an Arab Supreme Court justice. We have uh, the heads of major corporations like Bank Leumi, you know, uh, Arab Israeli. The, the concept that you could call us apartheid is absolutely ridiculous when, and it does a disservice in the same way that we get upset when we see a yellow star misused. I would argue that South African blacks should be upset when they see apartheid used in this way because it debases what actual apartheid was like. You couldn't have white and black people use the same bathroom, for God's sake. Israel, unfortunately, for its entire life, has been subject to war after war with the idea being to push us into the sea. And you know what? We won those wars. And that has consequences. And we have to do certain things for our security. If we need to build a fence in order to stop a wave of suicide bombings, where day after day, week after week, a bus was being blown up, you know, in Israel, then you build a wall, you do what it takes to survive. And I believe firmly, as did my father, that when one day the conditions for peace present themselves, and we have Palestinian neighbors who are willing to do what it takes to secure that peace, then I think you'll see a different Middle East. And maybe that's like waiting for Mashiach, but I, uh, I, I believe it's possible. But let's leave the term apartheid aside for a second. You're, some, you're somebody who's stood up for the rights of LGBT, for Syrian refugees, for women, for persecuted people all over the world. And there's some people who say, the guy who stands up for persecuted people doesn't say much about the plights of Palestinians, even if it's not an apartheid state. Yeah. They're, they they uh, have many rights that are denied to them. And why should we pay attention to somebody who can't identify the problems in his own backyard, but who goes around help criticizing the world for its abuses? So how do you respond to people who challenge? You've honored Bibi Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. You... you um, uh, you have the approach that you just stated about the Palestinians, that you're waiting for the conditions to exist. But in the meantime, is it, is it our obligation to speak up also for the, rights of, for the rights of the Palestinian minority? Of course. Look, I support Palestinian rights, and I support the Palestinian aspirations that they want to have their own nation and their own homeland. I, I understand that, and of course I'm empathetic to it. But I think we have to go piece by piece. So first of all, Israeli Arabs, and you know, there have been recent surveys on, you know, would Israeli Arabs, you know, like to move, you know, be happier under an Arab government or happier where they are? I think this was in Jerusalem. And, you know, some overwhelming majority said that they are actually perfectly happy, you know, with, uh, and they'd rather be governed by the Israelis because they do a pretty good job. So you have Israeli Arabs who in general um, have almost every option available to them. Uh, they can swear on a Quran and go to the army. They're not drafted, but they can. It's possible. Certainly mm -hmm. the Druze have done that, and they swear their oath on the Christian Bible. Um, you know, you can become a Supreme Court justice. You become the head of a corporation. You have many, many avenues that are open to you. Obviously, we've seen, you know, in the recent Gaza conflict, we saw that there was open strife breaking out in the mixed uh, cities of Israel, which was terrible. But again, you saw good people come forward and try to repair. But that's bucket number one, the Israeli Arabs. Then you have Gaza. So Gaza, you know, we keep hearing the word occupation, but Israel militarily pulled out of occupation, you know, from that area. And we withdrew completely to see what would happen. And sure enough, in 2006, 2007, as everyone knows, Hamas, you know, had an insurrection against the PA, and it became a staging ground for nothing but attacks in Israel from a group who wanted the complete destruction of Israel. Okay, so that was experiment number one on what military retreat looks like, you know, in giving land for peace. Uh, and now you're left with the West Bank, with Yehuda Vishomron. And, you know, the big question there is, can Israel militarily afford to have six miles from its most populated cities, you know, rockets coming in like they would come from Gaza? So, look, everybody's got their own view on this. My view is that when someday we see Gaza become something other than a terrorist base to attack Israel, 
maybe the belief can start to resurface in Israeli society that it's possible to have a Palestinian people living in a Palestinian state, um, you know, without it being a mortal threat to Israelis. But the are you worried is, that the American Jews don't get what you just? Oh, they definitely don't. Get. No, most American Jews don't. It depends. You know, the Orthodox probably get it, even although the Satmar don't. The Satmar, you know, they're they're on Israel wherever they are for their reasons. Um, but I think most American Jews do not understand this. I think that that's fair. But I also think, you know, to some extent, I understand the Israeli response to them. Like, who gives a crap what you think? You know, and, and you know, uh, the, some of the more controversial statements that American Jewry needs Israel more than Israel needs American Jewry. Look, I don't want to see a divide grow, but I understand a little bit where that remark is coming from. You know, how dare you when you're thousands of miles away throwing your brother and sister under the bus and accusing them of things when, um, you know, when it's not your kids that have to fight in the army. It's not you that's paying taxes. It's not you living with the consequences of what terrorism looks like. It's chutzpah. So uh, BDS, just a uh, follow-up to this, maybe specifically Ben and Jerry's. Uh, how do you think the Jewish community's response to the BDS motion of Ben and Jerry's? How do you evaluate it? And what lessons do you think we ought to learn from the Jewish community's response or lack of response to a major corporation challenging um, its business model because of the way um, Israel treats its Palestinians in the occupied territories? If you would have asked me a year ago if ice cream was going to become like, you know, the new, uh, you know, the new war zone, I, I would never have believed you. But here we are. And um, well, I ask you because it's a model. Right. And the fear, my fear is that this is where it starts. It starts at Ben and Jerry's and then begins to spread. And the pressures you of mean, the you, BDS movement go global. But oh, no, I think I think it's the other way. I think that the lesson of what's happening to Unilever here is being watched by other corporations. So that's what that, I'm asking. Yeah, I actually think that, you know, the anti-BDS movement has been quite successful. I mean, you know, it's like two dozen states already have announced that they're divesting, you know, in their pension, in their in their state pension funds from from owning Unilever stock. Like Unilever had no idea what hit them. You know, they're like, oh, my God, I guess we signed, you know, when we acquired Ben and Jerry's that they'll have their own board and get to speak out what they want. But they just did a big reorg. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point you see Ben and Jerry's on the, uh, you know, for sale. So I get one personal question. We've covered a lot of ground in 45 minutes. Um, but the interviewer gets one privilege, and I'm a rabbi, so it's a rabbinic question, because I've read almost all of your of your father's books, and I Probably love more than me. how he I love how um, particular how um, he manifests his struggles with God um, and the different stages of those struggles in his writings. Tell me about your uh, Jewish journey, about the role faith plays in your life. I was very gratified to see that between the TikTok dances and the Metallica, you're learning Talmud. So tell I'm, me sure, a bit I'm sure many in your congregation are doing Dafyomi. <laughs> it's, it's a great thing. <laughs> tell me a little bit about the role Judaism plays in your life. It's foundational. I don't think, you know, I realized how foundational it was really until two things happened. My son was born and my father passed. And it's funny, you know, my father only asked me to do two things for him in his lifetime, really like only two major asks. Ask number one was to only marry Jewish. And that was a guardrail that he put in place very firmly when I had started to date as a teenager. He said, do whatever you want, date whoever you want. I just want to be very clear. If you ever end up marrying someone outside, and I don't care if you bring in someone from outside the faith. If you get someone to come convert in kahalacha, you know, beautiful. I love that and I support it. But if you at some point come tell me you're getting married and it's to someone not Jewish, like that will be, he basically suggested it would be the end of our relationship and that it would break him. Um, and he made that very clear at a very early age. And then the second thing that he really wanted me to do later when he was sick already, and I would tell him, no, you don't mean it, you don't mean it. He said, you say Kaddish for me every day when I pass. Hmm. Do it right. And... Um, at the time, I thought he was asking me to do him a favor, one that he could no longer repay once he'd passed. But I realized once I'd started it that actually it was his last favor to me because my year of Kaddish really re-immersed me into Yiddishkeit. I hadn't worn tefillin in 30 years. I hadn't you know, been to shul this often. I hadn't gone to shul on Shabbos for God knows how long. 
And all of a sudden, there I am chasing after each minion, you know, make, getting every single Kaddish in, um, learning my role in the prayer service. Uh, it, it enriched everything I, I did. And I have to tell you, it was um, all of a sudden I discovered that I had this passport into a world I, I really had not paid attention to since high school. So do you still, are you still uh, participating in prayer services? I do. We have a, so we have a ski house in upstate New York. We, uh, you know, pre-COVID, we were leading Shabbos Mincha there. We've got a Sefer Torah. Um, I do the laning. Um, you know, I try to mix it up and get people to do dvars. So we lead our, we have our own little, you know, uh, community. And does some of your Judaism inform your, this is a gimme question. Does yeah. some of your Judaism inform your human rights work today? Look, it did powerfully for my father, right? So, so this is, you know, so it, of course it does for me. Tell, how so? Tell me how Jewish values motivate the human rights work. You motivated that ad in, uh, in the New York Times, motivated the way you speak up for Israel. Gosh, there's a, um, you're making me think a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I read a letter. Have you heard of Herschel Schachter? Do you sure. know that name? Sure. So he was the rabbi. The Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshiva University. And he was also, before that, he was the rabbi at Buchenwald. He was the, the rabbi at Buchenwald. Ah, that's a different Herschel Schachter. Ah, okay. So that's yes. the one I'm thinking of. Okay. The one that I'm thinking of said, you know, he's the one who turned to all the Jews at Buchenwald and says, you're free. And right. had the, you know, the first Passover Seder there, whatever, whatever was going on. He, he, re, he reintroduced Jewish life um, for those orphans, including my father. And a letter was found that he'd written to his parents in October 1942. And I just got to read it today. It's an amazing letter. And his parents had not wanted him to enlist. He was 26 years old. He was a uh, already ordained rabbi in Stamford, Connecticut, and had his whole life in front of him. And he decided he was going to go enlist. He didn't have to. We wanted to go enlist in World War II. And his parents thought he was nuts. And he wrote this incredible letter where he talked about the difference between Adam and Avraham and how Adam... When Hashem says, you know, where are you? Um, Adam hides and he says, you know, am I my brother's keeper? He's hiding from the problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you go to Avraham and Avraham, totally different response, right? Avraham, first of all, says, Hineni, where are you? I'm right here. And what does he do? He advocates for everybody. He gets his brother-in-law, you know, out of trouble. He goes and he advocates for if there are 10 righteous people in, in you know, the town of Sodom, don't, don't burn them. Uh, immediately, you know, stops from this, like, hiding from things and instead goes directly towards confronting the world and trying to help people. So, so I think it's so very found. It's a model for you to be the Avraham. Find the Avraham inside yourself that's willing to confront the injustices in the world. If we had five more hours, we could spend, you know, hours and hours talking about all the great role models we have in our faith. All right. I agree. So I, oh, Gail's saying there's no questions from the audience. So probably Amazing. everyone's just, everyone's just paying attention and hasn't had time to type, but please do. We have, we have a bit of time. So if you do have a question for Alicia, just use the chat box and, uh, and feel free and feel free to write to him. Um, Alicia, since there's no questions yet, can I probe a little bit yeah, more sure. on uh, on your uh, relationship with your father? Since I think that I think that that it interests a lot of people who are on the call uh, tonight. Let me just ask you a general question. Looking at uh, the challenges in the in the world today, um, if your father was around, um, how do you think how do you think he would be? Uh, preaching to us? What do you think his warning to us would be? Um, you know, it's funny. I think that uh, my father is often quoted on the topic of indifference and how the worst crime of all is to be indifferent. Mm -hmm. And I think as if you look around, we're indifferent to things like the Uyghurs, things that are far away, but we're all super passionate on all the things that are happening our own political stage. And we somehow moved past indifference there straight to screaming at each other. I think he'd ask us to, can we take the volume down and like remind us that even if we have different political views, uh, we don't have to hate each other this way. We don't have to reduce each other to sound bites. Um, we don't have to, you know, immediately paint each other in the most extreme views. Um, yeah, I, I, I think he would, it would be a plea for tolerance with each other in this. 
it's uh, you have this gift of optimism that's that's very refreshing alicia i think i think um in confronting some of the human rights uh, ch you know you talk about finding the anger inside of you and i think that you 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 uh, believe that at times it's appropriate but general generally is it fair to say that your attitude is optimistic and hopeful about the progress of of humanity and and the progress specifically of human rights in the world. I, I think it is. Look, my father was also optimistic, much as he saw a lot to depress him. You know, it, the, the amazing thing is that song that my father sung, right? Anima Amin, that somehow, despite everything, you know, still, you know, a Yid still believes in Mashiach, you know, still, still believes that, you know, redemption is at hand. Um, so, so yes, there you go. I'm, another I'm, Jewish lesson to that motivates your work, right? I Always think so. Believe I think so. But I don't know. Look, difference. I, I see some of the questions in the chat to fellow Jews who are like, really, I, I can't believe that you really have fellow Jews who are quote unquote, okay with swastikas. They may have, um, they may be embarrassed by it because maybe there are people they know and they don't want to confront it. Or maybe there are, uh, you know, there are people who agree with them on political, other political issues that have somehow become more important. But I don't know, maybe this is one of those cases where a little anger is, is appropriate. Again, I think that there's room for anger in relationships. Um, you know, I see a question on anti-Semitism hitting social media. Look, of course, social media has responsibility um, and needs to figure out what to do. And, and you know, they've become one of the biggest purveyors of, of disinformation. Um, I don't have a magic bullet for that because I also, you know, I, I take very seriously the commitment to freedom of speech that our Western democracies have. And it's a hard balance to find. Um, and the best way to address Holocaust deniers, my father had a quote that uh, when you become, a, you know, when you when you witness the testimony of a witness, you yourself become a witness. So we have to embrace the the Shoah survivors that we still have, hear their stories, um, breathe their air, be in the same space as them, so that we can tell our kids and grandkids and disbelievers, no, 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 no. I heard firsthand the testimony. You know, you you mentioned the Talmud study. One of the most striking things to me as I reimmersed myself in Talmud study after 30 years is just how much of the Talmud is one rabbi quoting another rabbi quoting another mm -hmm. rabbi. Right. Provenance is very important. Who said what is important? And the chain of the transmission of testimony is very important. And I think we're all part of that. When we, when we keep alive the stories of our survivors, we are entering that great big Jewish text effectively that defines us. So where's the failure when you talk about American Jews just don't get it, which I, I don't think is a crazy comment. I, I've said that a million times myself. Um, how do you relate what, what you're saying about the importance of memory and quoting previous generations to today's American Jewish community that just doesn't seem all that interested? Look, you know, I, uh, you try to do it in ways that come across. Have you seen the, um, the latest TikTok phenomenon, the Dafyomi girl? Yes, a few people have sent it to me. I mean, okay, so like... That's you know, your solution. I think it's part a cute of it. A girl right? people, doing Dafyomi. <laughs> first of all, first of all, I love the fact that Dafyomi is getting more airtime among Gen Z. But I think you have to meet people in the, in the places where they are. So I post on social media. I'm always looking to find people uh, who disagree with me particular and, and get on stage with them or debate them or discuss with them. Because first of all, ideas have to be heard. And if the worst thing in the world is that, um, you know, there's a disagreement, great. You know what happens after disagreement? Life moves on. And maybe you've moved each other. Maybe you've thought. I had this, um, it's not exactly a response to your question, but you're not being as tough on me now that we only have a few minutes left mm -hmm. to sneak it in. Um, I made this uh, pledge to myself at the beginning of the, uh, you know, of the last Gentile New Year, which was I was going to stop scoring myself after every political discussion did I score more points? You know, do I think the audience liked what I had to say more than the other person? And I started making my metric. Do I feel closer to the other person? And do they feel closer to me after the engagement that I had? And it changed my thinking a little bit, having that as a scorecard. It changed the way I kept score. And actually, I found led me to more productive conversations and enabled me to create a channel with which we could hear each other a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And American Jews should be spending more time, you're saying, listening to, and, and Americans in general should be spending more time listening to people who are different, less listening, time. Listening, period. We, we, 
we've got like if you had to draw like um, a picture of our face uh, where it's like frequency mapped to how often we use it, we'd have like these incredible mouths and these tiny little ears. <clears throat> Um, and I think we need to strengthen our, our listening muscles a little bit, because I'll tell you something about the divide between Democrats and Republicans and, and political parties. I actually believe that it's not as often as one might think a complete difference or opposition of values. I actually think it's a prioritization of values. Democrats tend to think freedom of choice more important, family values second. But I don't think it's that Democrats don't have family values. They just put them maybe a little bit below. For them, freedom of choice is more important. I don't think that Republicans are the other way around where they don't care at all about freedom of choice. In fact, they care a lot about freedom in certain contexts, just not when it comes to governing women's bodies. But it's a question of prioritization of values and which of these is the most painfully and, and, and pressingly felt value but you know what? We should be able to have a conversation, a national conversation, even an international conversation about the prioritization of values. And I'm a big believer in reframing debates in that way, because I believe that if you and I were to get in a room and argue about how would we prioritize one, two, or three, as opposed to is it A versus not A, I think we might be able to get to workable compromises a little bit better. Well, I think that that's a good point to end on, Alicia. I I think that it's in keeping with the hopeful message that you've presented, I think, throughout this interview. Um, and and it's um, it's really refreshing, I think, to hear a voice that's very familiar with a lot of the uh, abuses that are going on in the world today, but who still uh, maintains his hope that we uh, are marching slowly, albeit slowly, um, in the right direction. And I think that if, if it continues to be that way, it will be because of voices like yours that continue to yeah, uh, speak up and invest in, in the Jewish values that you uh, that continue to motivate your work and, uh, and all of us who should, uh, who should join you in that fight. Um, you uh, it just made me very proud to see, uh, to see that article, that it was uh, the Jewish, for all the talk about the hatred between Jews and Muslims, that it were it was three major Jewish uh, moral voices, with the loudest voice on the treatment of the Muslim Uyghur population in China, and Zionist um, voices, mind you. Yes, uh, yes, and Zionist voices as well. So, uh, Gail, do you want to uh, just offer some closing words? Thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. Um, let me unmute Gail. Yes. Thank you so much to both of you for uh, this engaging interview and for sharing candidly your thoughts. I'd like to once again thank Liberation 75 for partnering with Beth Tikva on this very important program. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, Alicia. Thank you, guys. Really enjoyed Alicia, it. Alicia, I hope you'll come visit sometime after the Amen. pandemic. You're welcome to come visit us in Toronto. We'd love to have you. I'm in, I'm I echo, in. I echo, uh, New York. I echo Gail's gratitude. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Be well, everybody. Chodesh and Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov.